I'm really excited about this morning. Um, I've been asked to talk about Pentecost. And how many of you know what Pentecost is? We're remembering Pentecost. Pentecost, literally, that word means 50th day. And it's the 50th day from the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Amen. And so there's a lot that happens in that period of time. So I'm going to read a scripture, we're going to pray, and then we're going to talk about, um, partially we're going to talk about what that 50 days look like. And then we're also going to, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my testimony and um, where I came from uh, when I got saved. So turn it with, you, with me over to Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. And it says, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Father, this morning we commit our hearts to receiving what you have for us. Your word tells us that your word accomplishes the purpose for which you spoke it. Lord, we, you don't need us, but you choose to use us to communicate, Father, your word and direction uh, that, that you want us to go. So this morning, we open up our hearts and our minds to hear from you, Lord, that we can take what you have for us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just to put us all in a place of, of realizing this, when you show up for church, Every Sunday, you come to a church, whether it's here or another church, or you're, you come uh, to our pursuit night, you're coming to receive something because you know that God's going to be lifted up, amen? Sometimes we come with things that we need, but we should always come to praise and worship and thank the Lord for what he's done for us in our lives. And when I read this story, uh, I, 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 I think about that 50 days and it culminates with Pentecost, with the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, which is what empowers us to be able to share Christ and see lives changed with that power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to know that what happened on the day of Pentecost wasn't a one-time event. It's still happening and has happened. It was the first, but what's a word that we would use to describe a Pentecost occurrence throughout history? It would be the word revival. And if you've uh, done any studying of, of biblical history, uh, and even recently, probably within, I know for sure, within the last 60 years or so, uh, we've seen some outpourings from real revivals that maybe started in an area and it grew. So when we look at Pentecost, which was that culmination of that period uh, that started with the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, it ended up with an empowering of the believers of the time to be able to spread the gospel. And I think they did a pretty good job because here we are some 2,000 years later and we're still serving and seeking and pressing in. Amen? But let's just look at what that 50 days was like. So you have the original disciples. And I love that the Lord didn't pick the theologians of the day. He didn't go to the synagogue and go, man, I'd really like that dude to be on my team. He really knows the Pentateuch. And, you know, I'm going to pick this guy. He's going to be a member of my team. You know, he really has got an insight into that Jonah character. He, these guys are really learned men. Who did he pick? He picked fishermen, tax collectors, just regular people, like you and I, regular people that he wanted to pour himself into. Was it an accident? No. Because whether we realize it or not, since... Uh, the third chapter in Genesis, God had a plan to redeem us back to himself. When we made that horrible mistake to choose ourselves over God, and we took of the tree of good and evil, since that time, God's been planning and preparing to draw us back to himself and redeem us to God. And so this story is the story of that moment when God sent his one and only son here on earth to redeem us back to the Father. So you're one of those 12. 
you've eaten with Jesus, you've been um, to um, the Sermon on the Mount, you were in with the crowds pressing in, you saw Jesus raise the dead, you saw the Lord heal the lame, you heard his words, you believed that he was the Messiah, and the next thing you know, over a period of a little less than a week, really, Jesus found himself in front of a group that had been plotting to kill him for a long time, right? And so you've put everything, you've left your jobs, you've committed your life to serving the one true Messiah. You knew this was the Messiah, but it didn't happen the way you thought it was going to happen. You thought that Jesus was going to come in and he was going to bring this, the host of heaven in to destroy your oppressors. But, but God had a bigger plan. Because let's just say that happened. Let's just say that the Lord had come and done that. What hope would there have been for us or mankind? Because first, there had to be a plan for God to be able to redeem us back to himself. That pesky, annoying sin that we deal with, well, Christ died for it. And, and I'll get to that a little bit later. So we're, we're, here we are. We're one of those disciples. We see this happening. Next thing you know, Christ is, is uh, taken captive and he's crucified on the cross and they take his life and they put him in a tomb what's that moment like for us if we're there and we had all our hope in this and almost immediately Jesus is we believe dead and in a tomb where would that put us so that's where they were when the crucifixion happened three days later um, what happened Christ rose from the grave. At first, they didn't believe it. Even though he'd been telling them that these things were hap- going to happen, they just didn't believe it. But he proved himself. Uh, in fact, it says that, um, well, just to lay a little more foundation, um, when that happened, when Jesus died, they didn't, have, um, they didn't have the Bible. It hadn't been written yet. It was 40 to 90 years away. Um, there was no church there were b- believers that now were scattered all over the place. There was no impartation of the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit hadn't come to change us. I mean, we are so blessed to be part of the people that God chose for this time. Did you know God intentionally created you and placed you at this place in time? And he placed within you giftings and talents you're specifically built for the time we're living in? Amen. To be able to draw others to be a light to this world and draw them to the cross. So they're down to about 120. Jesus raises from the dead. I, I'm tempted. I, get, I, I can chase a rabbit like the, as well as the next guy on this because there's so much scripture just talking about what that time was like. But let's just uh, fast forward a bit and we're going to get up to the, to the fact that during that time Jesus made himself known to a lot of people. There were a lot of witnesses to the fact that Jesus had raised from the dead. He had this really cool ability to just pop into a room like you're doing your own thing and you're talking about Jesus and boom, he's in your midst. And he had that 40 days. It was a period of 40 days before he ascended to where he was still had final instructions pouring into people, trying to prepare them for what? He was trying to prepare them for something specific. And what were they doing in, um, in that time is they were... Again, taking what they could get, now we're up to that 10 days. Jesus has now ascended into heaven. He told them to go somewhere and do what? I want you to go and pray for the next 10 days waiting on the promise that my Father has for you. Um, And that promise was the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about today that act. We just read that scripture um, that um, was the declaration and testimony of the power of God being imparted to people that were waiting in this upper room. What if you're that 120 in that room? How would you handle that? I mean, first of all, your your Savior, the Messiah, was crucified. Then, surprise, I've raised from the dead. And and, and then um, you're seeing so many things during that 40 days on top of what you had seen in the prior three years, and then you're told to go and pray and wait on the promise of the Holy Spirit. You know, this was the first impartation of the Holy Spirit. 
And if you think about that time that Jesus walked the earth and was crucified and then um, ascended to the heaven and we received the impartation of the Holy Spirit, um, mankind had only experienced the presence of God himself if you're looking at... Now, we know that Christ and the Spirit of God, the Lord moved during that time, right? But that physical um, presence of Jesus only happened for the, for the people on the planet earth during that period of time. And then in 50 days from his resurrection is when the Holy Spirit came in. So now we, mankind, we have the opportunity to take a hold of the fullness of what God intended for us, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm a weepy guy. Sometimes it'll take hold of me. I warn you, I'm okay. But that to me is so powerful when I put it into the context of those of us that are here this morning serving God during this time in the world. You know, it seems scary out there. We can, we can turn on the news and find a lot of reasons, just walk out the door, go to our schools. There's just so many places. We can see how hopeless it looks. It's not hopeless. God never says, man, I never saw that coming. He never says that. But he's prepared for a time that we're in right now, and he's prepared us to be a part of it. Amen? So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. There was What I want to do this morning is I'm going to talk about my testimony. Um, and our testimonies are powerful. Um, there's a scripture in Revelation that talks about the power of our testimony. And I think I'm going to grab it real quick. I'm allowed to do this, right, Pastor? All right. Revelations 12, 11, it says, And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. And in this scary book of Revelations, the pastor's teaching on, right now we're talking about the seven churches. I think we're through four. We've got three to go. Um, but in that book, it talks about those that were martyred and died for their faith. And that um, when the Lord returns, those people are going to be part of those that lead in that thousand-year reign of Christ. And, and so those are people that are being recognized for their testimony. That's something that you have. Your testimony is completely different than my testimony. So I'm going to tell a little about my, bit about my testimony because I think it ties in to the whole concept of what a revival is. But each one of you has a testimony, and it has so much power because your testimony talks about your failures and your wins. And guess what? In your failures, God enables you to see those failures redeemed by being able to minister to other people that are struggling through the same things, that are feeling the way you felt. Like I have no, God, I'm so separated from you. I've blown it. I've done this horrible thing. Oh, if I go to church, the building is going to cave in. It's not going to cave in. And if you're here this morning, proof positive, the building's still standing. But you have that testimony, and God wants to use it, amen? So um, I, I know, you know, again, been around the sun a few times, uh, seen a lot happen in the church, got saved in uh, 1971. I think it was 13 years old at the time. Uh, and, um, and in that time, one thing I can testify to is God's faithfulness. Did we have dark days? Yeah. Did I have days where I, things felt hopeless? Yeah, of course. Did I have times where I thought, there is no way that I'm going to survive this? I did have those days. And that was just in the physical side, the emotional side. Every one of us has a challenge and goes through these things, but in every one of those situations, God made a way where there was no way. Did it mean it was uh, rainbows and butterflies, the way it turned out? No. Some of those stories are the ones that God's redeeming, and he's given me an opportunity to share them to be able to bring other people to that place where they understand God really loves them and really cares for them and will never leave them and will never forsake them. So for me, um, I'll be 66 this year. Uh, I feel I got a lot of time left. I'm hanging around and I feel pretty good. Um, but there's a scripture in Psalms I want to read to you because this scripture... Um, it's a hard one for me to get through because I feel it so much because there is a point. I, I, rem I remember, I have memory 
um, and I'll, I'll get in that um, in a minute, of, of being saved and going through, uh, growing in the Lord and seeing those that were spiritual fathers in the faith to me, people that were in. It's funny because when I was 19, 20 years old, if you were in your mid-30s, you were, you were old. And, and I remember I was in an elders meeting. I, I was actually 24. I was an elder at a church. I think it was an experiment for the, the lead pastor, you know, he brought in the young guy. And I remember looking at these 35-year-olds. If they were 40, I'm just saying. They were old, right? And I, I, would, I would look at the people that are now my age, and those people, I was so blessed with a church where those people were just fountains of wisdom. And so that's really my prayer. In Psalm 71, 18, it says, Now that I am old and gray, do not abandon me, O God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. I know this scripture resonates with a lot of you in this room. A lot of you who maybe have thought you're, you're past that point where you're valuable. I know I went through a time where I really wonder, well, God, if I, if I kind of run my course, it's been a good run. I've been a part of a lot of really exciting things. Um, we were part of the Jesus movement. There's a movie. I learned it's now considered a historical event that really, <laughs> really set you up. Um, and this scripture just really spoke to me because that's really where my heart is. How many of you will acknowledge that maybe you're in that age group and that's your heart? You just really want to pour out what God has poured into you. Even you 45-year-olds, you know, you, you could feel that way as well. Woo! Amen. And so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into this. There's, there's a video, um, and uh, it's, I've never done this. This, this video is really, it's, it's a miracle that it's survived as long as it is. It's a, actually a bunch of segments of a good friend of mine. Uh, we were in ministry together for years. Uh, and started out in youth ministry. That's where every pastor starts out in youth ministry. Um, it's, we started out there, and he preserved all of these movies over time. And uh, a couple of years ago, we kind of had a little reunion up at Tahoe, and he brought this DVD where he'd taken all the tapes and had them burned to it. And I was able to convince him that I would not destroy it and take it home and let me burn it. He trusted me. I felt like I had the Ark of the Covenant a little bit there. And so my son Jonathan, last night actually, late, we put this thing together because I can tell you what it was like to be there in the Jesus movement. My wife Mary and I, um, we got saved when we were, um, again, 13, 14 years old. Uh, we started going, how many of you guys have seen the movie Jesus Revolution? So when that movie came out for me, it was kind of weird. In fact, to be honest with you, um, I didn't really think about the fact that we grew up during and, and we actually a part of that. Now, no, you didn't see us in the movie. I wasn't portrayed by, you know, somebody in the movie. My, I, we did serve at, uh, we started out uh, at All Saints and then Calvary Chapel. It was Calvary Chapel Riverside at the time when Greg started, Greg Lurie started the work there. Um, and we were teenagers in high school, all the way up through high school. Uh, Pastor Greg did our uh, wedding and then... Uh, we, I think our oldest son was dedicated there, and then we moved to a church that had a good intern ministers program. Made it all the way up to parking lot guy. I was night trained, and I had a flashlight with a little orange cone on it to park cars. I was good at it, brother, I'm telling you. And so that's where you start. You start in the parking lot, amen. But, but we were there. We were part of it. Um, and, I, and I watched the movie, and then um, word kind of got out that that uh, we were a part of that, and it was an odd experience for me because it was just, it was really just the, the story of what I'd grown up with. But I realized, um, as I've thought about it, really the last uh, year or so, what an incredible move of God it was. Now, I knew that, and I know that, and I knew it at the time, uh, but I didn't really know the effect that it really had overall. And I realized that that was just one event that happened at a certain place and it exploded and it grew and that there are more events to come 
And I believe that God started that even in our church. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move in uh, to this video. Mary and I, we met in high school. Um, we had a Christian club on campus when you used to be able to do that. Uh, we could even carry our Bibles in public there. And, and uh, there were over 100 kids at least that were part of that. Oh, I thought what I said was really good. Then it was just the pictures. Yeah. Those were our senior pictures. That was at me after a haircut. So, but I uh, love that tie. I still wish I had it. I would be honest with you. But we met in high school and we dated through high school. The thing that happened was with the Jesus movement starting, in Southern California, there were so many young people getting saved. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was so powerful and prevalent that you couldn't help but get swept up in it. And for us, we, we were just, we were caught up in uh, a group of young people that had just an incredible hunger for God. You have to ask yourself this question this morning. Do you have that hunger for God in your heart? Are you so hungry for God that you can't get enough of God? You just can't get enough of who he is. Do you, do you want to spend more time in prayer? Do you want to spend more time um, being with others who are believers that are going to build you up and not tear you down? They're going to hold you accountable. They're going to speak the truth in love. They're going to be there for you. We have a praying church. I'm going to tell you right now, I know firsthand that here at Convo Church, this is a pr church of prayer. We pray. That's not like a thing we do because we read a book and we've got our prayer division now and we've got um, our directors, you know, Kim and John Mangare are the directors of prayer at Convo Church. Woo! But if you get that app that, uh, that Pastor Carol was talking about, if you get that app you're, and you, you become one of our Dream Team members or you just want to be uh, have access to the prayer and praise chat on there, you'll go on there and there are people every day asking for prayer and every day people are giving testimony to prayers answered. And that was something that um, our lead pastors were very intentional about developing at this church because like those 10 days that ushered in, the presence of the living God, that prayer time, is so important to who we are and seeing God move. Amen. So um, in that time, uh, we did what all the young Christians did. I mean, we were all in our, you know, grew up uh, just serving the Lord. And that group of friends that we had, we were probably, most of us were in our 18, 19-year-old age when we got married. And I think I have a slide of that back there. That was our wedding. The, I should have put the other picture in because we, weddings were a big deal. I don't remember how many groomsmen and bridesmaids we had. It was like we each had seven or eight of each. But I want you to know, that's my brother, the best man, and he's holding a hat. We had all these really cool top hats as well. Huh? Right? Come on. And my bride, she's Awesome. And 47 years later, she still is. Amen. Yeah. Woo! So our testimony uh, ties into the fact that we saw all of this unfold. The thing about the Jesus movement was um, we, we saw, I know in the movie again, the, the movie really is from Pastor Greg's perspective. It's what he saw. And again, we all have our own stories when that was all going on, there was so much more going on. Over that time, uh, there were over 250,000 new converts in Southern California alone. And you couldn't drive around the city without seeing a group of young people in a park with a guitar, worshiping God. Worship would break out all over the place. It was, it was phenomenal. We we, we did do a little church traveling. We had our home base, but there'd be a concert here, and we would go there, and, because music's always uh, been a big thing in our lives. My wife is a, a, a music expert. She knows what she likes, and she likes it, you know, and, and so thankfully, she's, she's kept me connected in that area as well, but um, that's probably, enough. They, they probably enjoy that picture enough. To, um, 
what, I, what I've got here now is the video, and this video is a collection of these, these things that I was telling you about. We put this together because I can tell you about it, but I think there's, there's real power in being able to see what it was like. And again, this is my story, my perspective. My wife and I, it's what we grew up and lived at in, and I'm in there. It's the, probably the one, only one time that you'll ever see me without a shirt on, but it's from a distance, so you're safe. Um, but... I think this, this really captures, uh, this video captures what it was like. You're going to see some video about another time uh, uh, when we, I actually went to Washington for Jesus. It was the first event of its kind in the U.S. Capitol. It was before President Reagan was elected. And it, the purpose of it was to have the country come together to pray for our nation and realize that even we as Christians need to be involved uh, politically, we need to be involved in who is serving in our government, and we should hold them up to that lens of the Bible and how they compare to the Word of God, because we don't uh, bow or yield to the culture of our time, that yields to the Bible, the Holy Bible, amen? So let's get into this video. <laughs> that just in time for the little young there. This was Washington for Jesus. It was in, uh, I think, April of 1980. This is Mona Smith from Missouri. And um, I just kind of like to ask for a few questions. We're here at the RFD yeah, Stadium that's in Washington, D.C. And I was wondering what kind of a church background that you have. Well, I'm from a charismatic church. Um, it's Faith and Love Fellowship in Baldwin. But before that, before I met the Lord Jesus, I didn't belong to any church. I was an atheist. Okay. Uh, can you give me a little idea of what Jesus is doing in your area? Oh, we're witnessing and everything. It's really neat. The Spirit is really moving in the St. Louis area. A lot of people getting saved. Amen. Do you think the Lord's coming back pretty soon? I sure do. on the camera on that one, but it was like this all over the place. I'm Robert Williams, and I'm from the Kroki area. It's, it's uh, just south of St. Louis, and our church has been uh, a traditional Baptist church until about five years ago, until they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and uh, since this time, we've just um, we've received a call to be more mature and to come to know the Lord more personally. And uh, the commitment of seeking the Lord is good. And um, it looks, I don't, I don't really look for the Lord to be back real soon, like in the next one or two years. But I, I do see that he is, more than ever, he's preparing his body. And he's, he's really serious in these days. Amen. Thank you. My name's Ruth Casella, and I'm from South Lake Tahoe, California. 
Okay, hey, I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions. Um, can you tell me what church you go to first off? Yeah, the Church of Glad Tidings in South Shore. Okay, um, can you kind of give me a brief explanation of what the Lord's been doing in your area? Well, He's really moving mightily in the South Shore and all of that area in Lake Tahoe. There's a revival going on. There's spirit-filled Christians just giving Him the glory and lifting up the name of Jesus. My name is Heidi Curtis. Raymond Curtis, Miracle Revival, Tabernacle in Christ East St. Louis, Illinois. Amen. Uh, I was wondering if you could kind of tell me what the Lord's doing in your area right now. <laughs> well, the Lord is doing great things. We get things in, uh, in our area. And uh, so when we heard about, you know, this group wanted to go uh, come to Washington, D.C. to so lift Jesus up. So we were just willing and ready to come because we're living in such a terrible day that, you know, this is what we should do. And the scripture said if, if Jesus be lifted up, he would draw all men unto him. And so this is what we're doing here today is lifting up Jesus. Amen. Amen. The interesting thing about that day as well is, you know, when you have events like this, believe me, the enemy tries to play it down and uh, they try to report numbers below what really happened. And so the, the, the number I'm going to pull was from the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority and they're the people that bust and and subwayed people into the event and it was there at that time it was the single most um, largest day that they had people come in there were over 400,000 uh, trips of individuals coming into that area for that event and they, by this time in the 80s it had spread beyond just one area but really spread across the entire country and so uh, there are plenty of books that have been written about it. Um, it's really just uh, a, the testimony of that time. And so when I, when I looked at what happened in uh, the second chapter of Acts and that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I could really relate to that. For me, I was at a, a church service and I uh, was just worshiping the Lord and really pressing in all the 16 years old. And the next thing I know, I woke up on the floor and it was about 20 minutes later, I say woke up, I became aware of uh, the fact that I was still on planet Earth, I guess. Um, and I was praying in another language. I didn't know what that was. And I'm thinking, who's making that noise? And it was me. Um, it was, this was something that was happening on a regular basis uh, throughout that area. So I do know what revival looks like. Um, I also know that um, God chooses the time and the place for those outpourings and you know how that starts it starts with each one of us if people have come up to me and say well what basically what's the trick to having a revival well it's no trick it's like the 120 that were on their faces before God crying out and saying father I just want to be closer to you Lord enable me to tell the world about who you are and so this morning, that's what I would like to leave us with, is that challenge for us indivi as individuals to go, when we go from this place, to really spend the time with the Lord yourself. Let, let the Lord speak to you and challenge your heart this week. You know, maybe pick a 10 day period now where you can really just say, Lord, over the next 10 days, I'm, every day I'm gonna uh, take a scripture and challenge myself with it. Every day I'm gonna learn what it means to pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean that you're on your face, that you're hugging the carpet every day. I pray um, when I'm driving in the car, sometimes I need to because I need God's grace when I'm driving that darn car, right? But, but learn to be able to pray and just, I have to catch myself, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I'll be standing in line at a grocery store and I'll start to pray in the spirit out loud and I go, oh, wait a minute, these people don't know what this is. 
uh, because um, that's the beauty of that the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit the Lord sent the Holy Spirit this is a time where now we have the fullness of what God intended for us we have the Father Son and the Holy Spirit and you all we all we have access to the fullness of what God has for us to be witnesses in this dark time that we live in but guess what he also gives us a peace that passes all understanding he gives us joy that is different than happiness joy is a permanent thing that God can give us we also have one another the strength of what happened there wasn't that we were doing it alone we had all these sloppy Christian friends that I grew up with that we probably violated all kinds of uh, spiritual precepts you know and the way that things happen but we just wanted to serve God and um, I just want to just challenge us all this morning as we go from here to be able to challenge ourselves to press in to see God do more this week in our lives amen